Almost as if there was a man in a wheelchair. Look, there's another. Why are they coming after me in their Mercury Montenegro, eh? I'm all out of lens references. I'm sorry. I think he's hiding out from cops, but also drug dealers. I don't know. I'm not fully caught up. I just focus on the cat killing parts. Is it a jitterbug? Is it a jitterbug? It's the I Hate Infinite Jest Podcast, coming to you episode fucking 20. It's the I Hate Infinite Jest Podcast, pages 563 to 593. You're gonna hit that Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome back to the I Hate Infinite Jest Podcast, number 20. Who ever thought we'd have made it? Pages 563 to 593. That was the song this week, as you can tell, I kind of phoned it in. It's so weird when I don't have ideas. It was only as I was recording this, like, I could have written a song from the point of view of Mario and his uh, overflowing of empathy with the human race and all people, especially Hal. Maybe I'll do that next week. Again, it's so hard when just nothing jumps out yeah, as a as a song idea, but oh well. Uh, I am, as always, your host, Jesse Dram. Find me on all the things at Jesse Dram, at Mr. Jessico on YouTube, at Diamond Joe Quim. Not trying to run out of characters, just had to be dirty. Um, Our guest this week is David Jensen, who you can find online at all the places at Infinite Jensen. That is without a space, without an underscore, and with two E's in the Jensen. Infinite Jensen. I have been referring to his artwork since roughly, I think, like the third episode. And I've actually stated how I've had a, a hard time coming to grips with the the tone of Infinite Jest. I had a really hard time just get like, what does this world look like? Because I'm, I'm thinking of things realistically, and it doesn't really makes sense but when I first started finding his sketches that he made of scenes from Infinite Jest uh one that we comment upon in particular that I liked with Hal's grief counselor who was a very large rotund man who wanted him to express himself but always kept his hands hidden only in their final meeting becoming 
overwhelmed and gregarious at uh, Hal tricking him into thinking he'd made progress, went to shake his hand, and this giant rotund man had the hands of a four-year-old girl. And little little things like that, like, okay, this is a cartoon universe. And seeing the world like that, it really it really helped me to picture the story as I went along. Not to be, I think his sketches of Mario, like when you look up Mario in Candenza on Google, it's almost always his sketches of him that come up first. And it's 100% who I picture in my head. I was really glad to have him on. We talked a lot about we talked a lot about mental illness. We talked a lot about AA. We talked a lot about infinite jest in general. A really interesting point. We've discussed how people who tend tend to become devotees of infinite jest uh, very often encounter this book when they were young. Now, that's why I find David a very interesting guest to have, because not only did he not find it when he was young, but he actually was not only a contemporary of, but had a lot in common with David Foster Wallace. They were both roughly the same age, both uh, dealt with addiction and mental health issues. I'm not, I'm not telling tales out of school. He mentions it in the podcast. Uh, both grew up in Northern Illinois and both played on the junior tennis circuit. Uh, he actually says it's, it's almost certain that they ran into each other at some point and he just didn't know. So I really like the idea of somebody coming to this book and uh, just because so many people seem to, like, aspire to it and the intelligence of David Foster Wallace, as opposed to, we've been talking in the AA chapters about IDing, identifying, and here we have somebody who identified with this book on a personal level as one of David Foster Wallace's contemporary in both age and background. So, yeah, I found that extremely interesting. Check out all his stuff. If you're listening to this episode, I would implore you, number one, check out Infinite Jensen on Tumblr and on Twitter. I also implore you, look up the YouTube version of this episode. It's it's not going to be up right away just because it's too much goddamn work. It's already 1030 on a Sunday night Eastern time when I'm recording this. I just don't have the time to do it. But I'm going to try to put and make a slideshow on the YouTube version of this audio with his uh, sketches. Not only the sketches I like, but in reading the section we did today, 563 to 593, I just happened to notice on Twitter, like, oh, he's putting up sketches from the very specific chapters we're looking at. The one in particular that stands out was uh, Bruce Green Sr. and Mrs. Green and the macadamia nuts can of snakes uh, worked its way in there. So, yeah, the guy took it to the extra level he not only did his research for the show he made brand new sketches to go along with the i hate infinite jest podcast surely we can't be all that bad guys i think i've jacked my jaw enough again jesse dram on all the things look up infinite jensen go watch the youtube version of this episode maybe i might be able to get it knocked out before i do a promotion tomorrow we'll see guys thank you very much we only have like 13, 14 episodes left. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I've I've contemplated just changing it to the title to I Hate Books. But then from there, we would have to find another book that is both... Uh, one of the interesting things about Infinite Jazz is the book came out 24 years ago. But if you were to search it on Twitter right now, there would be several people who have mentioned it just in the last hour. And not only only in the uh, poor Horatio or poor Yurik, a fellow of Infinite Jest, I knew him well, but actually quoting the book. So I'm trying to find a book that is still so much in the zeitgeist that can be torn apart. Like, I guess it's popular to hate Harry Potter now. I never read that in the first place. I don't know. Can I be a dickhead for seven Harry Potter books? I'm doing okay being a dickhead of post postmodern literature, but that's like J.K. Rowling will put a spell on me and shit, and then she'll have a vendetta. She won't let me use my proper bathroom, and then she'll cast an expelliarmus on me, preventing me from conjuring a toilet of my own design. And guys, I don't have health insurance, so I don't know what I'll do after that. It's hard enough getting a COVID test. I don't know how to... Uh, get undone a bewitching from a transphobic British author. Wow, I'm really rambling on this week. Enough of my bullshit. David Jensen, check it out. Later.
episode 20. Happy Monday, everybody. It's I Hate Infinite Jest. Again, episode 20. That is XX in the Roman numerals. One, one away from a porno. We're doing pages 563 to 593. My guest this week, I have been referencing him since roughly episode three. Very excited to have him on. David C. Jensen, a.k.a. Infinite Jensen. How are you doing, my friend? Oh, I'm doing great. Glad to hear. Very glad to hear. Before we get started, uh, where can we find you online? What are what what are you putting out there? What what should the people go see? Well, you know, um, I uh, well, uh, I'm uh, Infinite Jensen on Twitter, uh, also on Tumblr, uh, Infinite Jensen, also um, where. I think on uh, Twitter is full of all kinds of weird stuff, but the Tumblr has uh, just my drawings of uh, of infinite jest in descending order because that's how that works. <laughs> yeah, so I if would... you want to start at the if you want to start at the beginning, you have to start at the end. Exactly. Plus, if I recall, you do actually have like uh, it numbered. You have the sketches numbered by the page that uh, the scene appears on, if I do recall correctly. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, they make no sense. Yeah, it would be. It, 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 it's not. It's you're not going to get lost. Let's put it that way. To listening right. audience. So yeah, I was just. Uh, you and I were just discussing. I have been referencing your artwork on this podcast for quite a while, and I only recently. Uh, reached out to have you on. I don't know why it never occurred to me, but yeah, your, uh, your sketches have done a lot to really help me get my hooks into this book. Cause uh, I had a real problem with the tone at first. I feel like people say this book is a comedy yet it deal. Well, you know, part of it is a comedy, but so much of it is yeah. so, you know, filled with like pain and anxiety that it's really, I had a hard time picturing just about, anything but once i actually got to look at your sketches which granted are but one of many it's your own personal interpretation but uh it really helped mm. me solidify what when i started seeing things as a bit more cartoonish they started making more sense to mm -hmm. me like uh when we had i believe it, mm -hmm. was, it was hal when he's talking with the grief instructor and then at the end he, this gigantic man has these little yeah. tiny baby hands it was when i saw your sketch of that like Okay, I get why this is funny now. So, so yeah. yeah, thank you yeah. very much. For well, that. I, oh, yeah, you're very welcome. Um, the, the, this this book strikes me as a cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, it is. It is. It, it's very tragic, um, but it's ridiculous yeah. at the same time, um, and uh and it's to me very visual mm -hmm. uh i started I, st I started um by listening to an audio the beginning of an audio book of infinite jest um and uh i decided to to read the book and i have a terrible memory um uh, my, you know, in reading my, uh, my comprehension is good, but my retention is terrible. Mm -hmm. Like personally uh, with, with this book, if I were not actively taking notes every week, I don't, I don't think I'd remember who people were from week to week. Like, uh, like especially because I get into it in this week, like Oren pops back up and you realize like, oh, we haven't seen Oren in like 150 pages. Now, right. obviously, Oren is very important to the story, but if we get to somebody like an Erdity or a Kate Gompert or a, a Randy mm -hmm. Lenz we meet early on, if not for having done this podcast and really like gone over with a fine-tooth comb like it was homework, because it was, I don't know if I would have mm -hmm. had any retention to who those people were when they actually showed back up. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, and the other thing, and and you've mentioned it too. I've I've found that you don't get character descriptions sometimes for hundreds of pages later. Yeah. So you're familiar that with is. a character, but it's like Mario. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I had my, I had, I had my mental picture of what, you know, who Mario was, what Mario looked like, See, but it wasn't it. until who knows, 300, something like that. You mm-hmm. know, it's like, okay, now I'm, you know, now there's a description. See, that's um, one of the more frustrating things about the book for me. Cause like, you feel like you have an image of somebody and then it, it's almost like DFW was writing it and just goes like, uh, I need details. And then he'll literally just go in a paragraph like, by the way, he has a long eyelash and box shoes and Tyrannosaurus arms and, right. you know, all that. Right, right, right. Mm. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty funny. So it's, you know, I'm toying with the idea now that I've been doing this for on and off for four years, I think. I think I started doing this in 2016. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm toying with the idea of firming up some of these drawings and then doing something with them um, as opposed to just having them in a drawer. Mm -hmm. Um, um, But it would mean going over the book again. Mm -hmm. Um, Because just even, uh, you know, I did did, uh, some drawings for the chunk we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I saw um, that. I was popping up on Twitter, and I just happened to notice, like, huh, that, uh, that sketch there is from the chunk we're doing today. I wonder if that's all. Yes. And it turns out it was, which <laughs> is going to be a nice little uh, ultra extra medium edition of this podcast. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in, in looking, over the, looking over the chunk again, there are, there are scenes that uh, I think need to be, need to be drawn. Um, there could be, there could be a thousand drawings for this book because there are just little asides that Mm -hmm. are crazy to picture. Oh yeah. Like, uh, we get, uh, the, the, the tragic story of Bruce Green's parents in, in this, Mm -hmm. which like, Mm -hmm. I'm sure this is like the only time we'll hear about them. Like this is the side. I, I, I do get the, uh, I do get the appeal of this book in its world building in that Bruce Green mm-hmm. is somebody we've spent almost no time with, even that as an ancillary character. But now we have all this biographical information to fill in that character. Right. Right. Um, and uh, some similarity between Green and uh, uh, what's his name? lens mm. just in that you know they've got they've got tragic mother death uh in common which is mm-hmm. interesting this uh, chunk is a lot about mothers it is actually and i don't think yeah, i it is. together quite so much but it definitely mm. is um how, how did you first discover the book well you know it um the first thing i read of Wallace's was an essay he wrote about um, Roger Federer. Mm. I think it was Roger Federer as a religious experience or something along the, those lines. The, the tennis and, player, yeah. Yeah, and I'm uh, a tennis fan from way back and a fan of Roger Federer, so I read the piece and I liked um, the way it was written. Mm. Um, and, uh, I came across another, uh, I think, I don't know, another essay, I think about Tracy Austin. Mm, um, yes. Tracy Austin broke and, my heart. I'm a big fan of that article. Yeah, I am too. I was, see, I read that. I liked that. Um, and then I decided I was going to learn something about David Foster Wallace just from reading those two mm-hmm. articles. And I found uh, some similarities that were really striking to me. Um, uh, he and I are the same age. Mm. Uh, so were he still here, he'd be as old as I am, mm. uh, which would be pushing 60. Um, uh, I, uh, grew up in Northern Illinois. Uh, you have that Midwest played, background. Yeah. Um, I played junior tennis at the same time he played junior tennis. Um, 
we may have met at one point playing tournaments in Northern Illinois. Who knows? Oh. Um, uh, and uh, I have uh, considerable experience in the 12 steps. Hmm. Um, and maybe I'm a little more uh, disclosing than I should be, but he and I uh, share um, the uh, comparable mental illness. Ah, okay. So, so I'm reading. I'm reading Infinite Jest through a lens through a lens that uh, I think is similar to the one he was writing from. Mm. Um, uh, I'm convinced that Wallace was bipolar. Uh, uh, yeah, you definitely, know. You, you definitely get a sense of that in some of the stuff where people write about him, where he mm -hmm. would go from despondent to like, you know, inviting people over to like watch old 80s sitcoms for hours and like real kind of like manic, like, yeah, you know, the, the yeah. classic manic and depressive. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this giant ass book uh, seems manic to me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it it really does. Mm. It really does. Um, and I can identify with that to a degree. Uh, so, you know, so I pick, I pick up this book and it's about junior tennis and, uh, and the 12 steps. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I know these things. Mm. Um, and as I started reading, I thought, you know, I'm never going to remember this book like all the other books that I don't mm. remember. Um, and so I started taking notes and the way I take notes is drawing little pictures. Okay. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, uh, oh, uh, I, I was reading along with a group called Infinite Winter. It was like an online reading group of Infinite Jest. Mm -hmm. I assume that would be and, the, in, the inverse of uh, the Infinite Summer people who tend to exactly. like we read it every year. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, in a, in a, I, I just decided at that point, you know what, I'm going to post these drawings as we read along. Um, so that's how I started posting these things on Twitter. And it's just, uh, it's just going and it's just uh, an ongoing thing. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, you're, you're coming from a, a very interesting background with, uh, I've noticed that before in books where there is something very powerful where like, as you're reading, there is a little bit of a sense of like, oh my God, this is written exclusively for me. It almost feels mm -hmm. like when I check yeah. so many boxes. Like I've had a small degree that I remember when I first read uh, Joe Hill, Stephen King's son, when I first read his book, mm -hmm. Horns, within like the first five pages, he randomly mentions like an obscure Japanese rock star who died of autoerotic asphyxiation that I'm yeah. a huge fan of. And I was like, oh my God, where the hell did that come from? Like, right. Just so specific that, like, okay, well, I'm I'm hooked on page five, right, right, yeah, exactly, exactly. So you know, so I I'm looking at this book from my own, yeah, I look at this book from my own perspective. Um, I am a, a an oil painter as well, and my style is is surrealism. Uh, and this book is surrealism to me. It's surrealism uh, with tennis and, and rehab. And I mean, <laughs> you know, good God. <laughs> well, I mean, what could be more surreal than tennis and rehab? I, I it, mean well, that. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you can fuse them together. Absolutely. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. You know, there was some guy I saw on Twitter who is both a major Infinite Jest fan and also a tennis coach. I, I wanted to try to have him on to see if he could get into the details. And unfortunately, he's too busy. But that would oh, that would have been so interesting. Um, yeah. What What are your takes on? Do you agree with his? Does, is he accurately representing like tennis, particularly the tennis uh, junior tennis league? Um, I guess. 
It, well, it, he is uh, turned up to eleven. Um, I, <laughs> I remember when I was a uh, when I was playing. Um, the big deal was uh, uh, Nick Bolateri's tennis academy in Florida, mm. and that's where all the very best players were going. And um, it was. Uh, uh, a very dictatorial place and there was, it was, uh, but it was, it was storied, um, mm -hmm. among the junior players at the time. And I, I'm just seeing this as, uh, the Enfield Tennis Academy kind of comes from, comes from that. And he, right. he has to have, he had to have had the same kind of memory. Exactly. Well, that, tennis. Yeah, that couldn't have been just conjecture on, on mm -hmm. your part. Like, this is something he would have been aware of in the tennis community. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Hmm. So, yeah, that's something, that's something I hadn't considered. I know we had on a, a few weeks ago, it escapes me who it was right now, but it was somebody who was actually in the Boston area, and uh, they're parsing together, like, what parts of the book were from what parts of Boston – it's always mm -hmm. interesting to have like a real world analog going on. Like, I, I feel like the basic way everybody has that is if you live in a city and then you watch a movie or a show that is based in that city, like there's always going to be like the little nods and touches that like you really would only get if you were from there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I grew up in Chicago. So watching the, uh, mm. the Christian Bale Batman movie was pretty cool. Cause you know, that was zooming around Chicago. Yeah. So, so, we, it, so it was a cooler movie for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we always get that in Philly, particularly with like the Rocky movies, but that's actually kind of mm -hmm. the fun where it's like, ah, oh, they say he's in South Philly. That's, that's freaking Kensington. Don't, don't lie to me on that. <laughs> right, so I know right. there was a, there was a movie a few years back with like Gerard Butler called law abiding citizen where like he, the mayor is asking him to do like some special uh, force. Like here, I need to swear you in and deputize you. And then the guy who comes in holding the Bible for him to swear on, like, it's the actual mayor of Philly. So, like, everybody uh -huh. just sounds like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you ready to get into the notes for this week? Sure. All right. So, again, to people out there, we're doing pages 563 to 593. David, uh, any point if you want to join in or you have a comment, just, just interrupt, all right? Okay. All right. Okay, uh, select snippets from the informal interface moments of Gately, 11.30, November 11th. Uh, Joel and Gately are still having a conversation. Joel asks whether Gately's dad is still alive. Joel says her mom is long dead, worm farming, but daddy is still sucking air. She tries to correct Gately's Boston accent of the word hard, which if those of you out there who are listening don't get that, the Boston people, they uh, are not good with their R's. He would say hard. Yeah, it's... Yeah. It's, it's wicked hard out there when you suffocate a Canadian. Uh, someone comes in and complains to Gately that Jeffrey Day is fucking with newbies by asking philosophical God questions, such as, could God make a suitcase so heavy he himself couldn't lift it, but it's making one of the newbies blow a fuse. And a woman named Yolanda complains that her sponsor is trying to get her to blow him. Her sponsor is Lens. <laughs> because of fucking course, it is Lens. So yeah, we, right. That's her. That's his, That's her. That should be her higher power, right? Yeah. <laughs> God, that's the. Uh, this is the. Uh, not having gone through the program myself, but knowing a bit about AA, it is nice seeing that a little bit there, where it's like, it's not a rule, but it's strongly encouraged. Just like stick stick with the the gendered sponsor you're not attracted to, or is not attracted to you, because it's just kind of asking for trouble. Right, right. Thirteenth stepping, they call that. That's right. The thirteenth step is dating somebody else in AA. I cannot yeah. tell you how many young former addicts my mom has tried to set me up with before I found my current. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful. Nice, very nice girls. Um, yeah, we get our first uh, mother death. Yes, exactly. Uh, in this right one, there. too. And is is there... I don't know. Is there more about the worm, the worm farming accident? Uh, not in this particular section. I have read ahead a little bit, and I think uh -huh. 
I had been informed what happened there, which uh, I guess if you guys don't want spoilers, skip ahead 30 seconds. I don't know why you're listening to this podcast if you don't want spoilers. <laughs> um, so the at some point, she tells somebody that her disfigurement is her father admitted to being sexually attracted to her. The mother found out. The mother threw acid at uh, the father, and the acid hit Joel. And after, after oh. which, Joel's mother killed herself. Now, from what I understand, this is a very, like, she could be telling the truth. She could not. Like, people, it, it's in dispute, but it does seem to be a suicide. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, 565. We are back with Oren, who we have not seen in over 100 pages. We see him embracing a Swiss stewardess, but are immediately yanked to a long footnote, 234. This is yeah. from an interview with Steeply. Oren is refusing to answer questions about his father's mental health or why he no longer talks to his mother. Meanwhile, he takes the time to compliment Steeply's pantsuit. In his... <laughs> yeah. they, they, they do that a few times in this where he's going on yes. like, oh, yeah, well, my dad killed himself and my mom was all sorts of like, you know, you really fill out that skirt quite well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love it. I was just, you know, just uh, every now and again, just hitting on her. For, for me, one of the funniest subplots in the book is absolutely how every time we see Maraith and Steeply, there's a focus on how Steeply looks so ridiculous dressed as a woman mm -hmm. and yet from everybody oh, yeah. else's perspective like something kind of hot about that helen steve right <laughs> right yeah, i know i know i know with those lo lovely feet mm. um so in uh, in himself's last few years he drank himself blind made crazy art films devised a glass that wouldn't fog or smudge and shook at least two hours with delirium tremens every day mentions that a critic was fooled by himself's found genre, genre hoax, and the guy disappeared from the profession for a year and came back with a vengeance against James. For those of you who recall, uh, James set up a whole fake genre of cinema, paid off a bunch of critics to write about it, and then only later revealed it all to be a hoax on the critiquing community, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, Oren will not confirm or deny whether he thinks Avril is insane says he doesn't trust her or want to be around her. She formed a group called the Militant Grammarians of Massachusetts that went batshit when a billboard ad used the possessive form of its with an apostrophe yeah. I-S. She only eats late. She hasn't stepped foot off of Enfield in years, aside from James's funeral. Says she has OCD, but hasn't been diagnosed as her OCD helps rather than hinders her responsibilities. She keeps her head attached to Hal's, but without being too overt. Hal lives for the applause from only one set of hands, hers. Says Hal or Mario will have to get away from her to ever realize how much she rules their lives. Mentions a great quote from James, which is, quote, cliches earned their status as cliches because they were so obviously true. So, yeah, taking a second, I think this might be the first detail we get about Avril not setting foot off of uh, the Enfield grounds in many, many years. Yeah, he goes, uh, gets into her OCD mm -hmm. uh, pretty in a, in a pretty detailed way um, and uh, relating it to, I guess, a doubles partner of his that had, OC that had some pretty intense OCD also. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, do you, have, do you have notes on that? I know, I, I know it was in there, but there was just so much in this section, so I didn't know what to pick you up. Know, it really was. It was, uh, you know, he was talking about, uh, uh, which is his ex doubles partner, Bane. Who That's right. Yeah. Okay. Had to have a T square on the court to make sure everything was, everything was intersecting at 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, you had to feel all the way around doorways to make sure they were, they were square before he could go through them. Um, and then uh, just uh, relates, relates that to the mom's OCD. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a, a, a passage in here um, 
where he's talking about how how close she's got to be with with Hal, and it it goes back to something earlier in the in the book. Uh, it says it says she's got to keep Hal's skull lashed tight to hers without being so overt about it that Hal has any idea what's going on. Mm-hmm. And I to believe wasn't from trying to. What, wasn't yeah, earlier, Oren said that some fantasy of like wearing his mother's head almost like a helmet. Yeah, and I think there was a, a reference to that earlier in the book where Hal had a, a dream where his, his mother's head was attached to his by tennis racket strings. That's what I was thinking. And if um, I recall correctly, you have a pretty great sketch of that somewhere. I, yeah, I drew that. That's way back towards the beginning. Yeah, that one that one really stuck with me when I saw it. Yeah, so this this when I when I read this in the in the footnote leapt out at me. It's like, oh wait a second, I've seen I've seen that in my head before. Mm-hmm. All right, so we, he continues. Uh, Oren tells Steepley the only the the truly malignantly crazy people is how they make the people around them feel like they're the crazy ones. He recounts a time mm-hmm. when he was twelve and Hal was four. Oren was helping Avril with a rototiller out in the garden when <laughs> Hal comes out holding some fungus he'd been eating, ready to burst into tears, uh, a nasal green fungus with black and orange speckles. Avril loses her shit in not only matern- maternal panic, but the OCD sufferer's realization that the filthy, dangerous world has pierced her safety zone despite all her precautions. Mm-hmm. While she loses her shit, Oren recalls seeing Mario and James off in the distance, looking on as if framing a potential shot. Yeah, yeah, yes. It's a beautiful. nice little, nice little view of the Incandenza family in happier. It's a, be- <laughs> it's a beautiful scene. I, I, I really want to uh, at some point draw this scene with the, with the moms freaking out and a big pile of mold and mm. and Mario and and the stork with uh, <laughs> behind a behind a screen door, just going, hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> I'm hoping we get some more scenes with uh, Mario and James before the book is out. Cause uh, mm-hmm. like in, in this section we get to jumping ahead a little bit, just to mention it. We actually see the world from Mario's perspective for the first time. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, we've heard a lot about his interaction with other people, but always from the third person. I actually would really like to see Mario and James. Cause it seems like they had such like weird little, invent- even in this, this little sketch, we're just like, there's all this mayhem going on and they're just over there still, you know, playing movie making. No right. Matter what's right. happening. Yeah. yeah. And from what I understand, Hal eating the mold is like a very, very important thing in the mm-hmm. book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll come back. Um, so back to the main text. Oren has met the stewardess after she approached him for an autograph from Wait For It. Her toddler-aged son, and everyone knows Oren yes. cannot resist the MILFs. Um, <laughs> at, at the place, after she lays out photos of her family on the nightstand, uh, right. she Swiss, so was her toddler by proxy. He yeah. bathes in the conquest of the subject, happy to feel that for only a moment she is completely his. And we get a, an interesting little breakdown here on Oren's idea of uh, love. He thinks this possession is better than having a the one as far as love. He had his yeah. the one once that was Joel, and he was traumatized yeah. enough to never do it again. He says if he felt uh, the one with somebody else, that would be the, the love between them would be the focus as opposed to his preference where somebody else becomes his possession. Mm-hmm. So like, weird little philosophical stuff here, but I definitely philosophical, psychological stuff, but uh, still yeah. pretty interesting getting in the head of Oren. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, the last, the last paragraph in that little section is, uh, talks about how his, his, uh, his attentions are, are really a kind of contempt and hatred for his subjects. Oh yeah which is which is interesting yeah definitely well you know just like anybody else people who tend to hate themselves and take it out on other people i don't know if we're in that deep with Oren. i guess i can't say that he hates himself but he's clearly dealing with a lot of stuff 
a lot of a lot of mommy issues, which I know vaguely yes. some of what's coming, but not entirely. So I won't get into that yet. Right, right. Um, we get a fun scene in the hallway with a a new character. I think Idris Arslanian has he has he come up before? Because I I, I, I can tell he just shows up here. I think I think so. He's okay. just he's. Uh, yeah, he plays a wonderful uh, plays a wonderful role in this next little section because uh, he's he's just he just has to use the bathroom, right? And that's <laughs> that's really that's so, what we get out of him. So what we get here is Arslanian is wearing a blindfold on instructions from Coach Thorpe, who uh, is experimenting with something after scouting the soft skulled blonde nine year old, uh, blonde blind nine-year-old yeah. uh, a theory about hearing the ball off the racket and determining the ball's trajectory um arslanian is looking for the bathroom bumping into people he's some kind of exchange student foreign so he talks a little bit like you know it would be good for me to use the bathroom now please and thank you a, right. a very stilted kind of speech uh he bumps into pemulus in the hallway only for him to discover pemulus is also wearing a blindfold uh, the kids are all watching Doucette have a meltdown in the weight room who is seeking Lyle's help. They have a long discussion about the toxic waste in the concavity, how it's degrading in a former Air Force base, how James and Candania's last big invention was holographic conversions, which the process isn't explained well, but the gist is it lets scientists measure toxic particles without being exposed to them. And uh, this actually has a bit to do with the state of the concavity overall says the process mm -hmm. came out of medicine and a new tactic used to fight cancer in the infant Jess universe is by giving cancer cancer. So yes, yes. Injecting cancer cells with cigarettes and diet sodas and beef chemicals. This method of blasting radioactivity with more radioactivity, not only makes some places terribly toxic, but enough so that the areas surrounding are sucked out of all of their poisons leading to an all too powerful purity. This is why areas around the concavity are roaming with feral hamsters and gigantic infants. These process in and out, and an area will go from nuclear wasteland to lush rainforest in the same month on a cycle. And I may be reading this wrong, but it seems to suggest that there are actually time fluctuations of acceleration and deceleration, depending where they are in the cycle. Uh, Aslanian all the time really just wants to use the bathroom. and. <laughs> And the discussion ends with Pemulus asking him for some of his pure, clean Muslim urine for his urine mm -hmm. sale operation on the side. That's right. So That's yeah, right. I'm, I'm wondering if you had any specific plans for this urine urine I'm so <laughs> anxious to get rid of. I mean, hey, I can, again, having, uh, knowing some people in recovery, I have given clean urine more, more than a few times. <laughs> Uh, may have may have been a Mother's Day present once, and I'm not joking. <laughs> uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful. Yeah. So I actually, uh, again, just in a random silly conversation, and they give us so much detail about the the toxicity of the concavity slash convexity, and really, yeah. was I reading that right? Is there something about time acceleration and deceleration in there? Or was I that's, misreading that? No, that's what they're, that's what they're getting at. Okay. Um, not that I can wrap my tiny little mind around it. I, I feel like I, you know, while reading this, I had to go to the bathroom too, <laughs> which I think that was a nice little, uh, uh, I think, uh, a little device to help us <laughs> because I, you know, I was right there. I was right there with, uh, with ours. Like, okay, whatever, whatever. Uh, yeah, you know, whatever. I just need, I need to get through this, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was a good, a good little exposition and a nice comedy scene. Mm -hmm. um, we just, yeah, I want to, I want to see a, I, I want to see a landscape painting of the, concavity with the I mean I did a little little drawing with I think a giant ant and uh mm. oh yeah guy, I saw, smoke, yeah, you, guy you, smoking you. a blunt with his tie-dye <laughs> parka on uh and the the giant infant and yeah I, I saw the giant infant beautiful 
honestly, with, with that kind of description they just got, I'm actually almost picturing like one of the old Hieronymus Bosch triptychs where Absolutely. like you have like the lush rainforest and then the barren hellscape bubbling mm-hmm. food next to each other. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. With the giant uh, feral hamsters just running through eating everything. I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually very glad he explained that because that was one of the descriptors where it's like, where the hell is this coming from? But to actually, mm-hmm. you know, try to, that, that's the thing with, with sci-fi. Like, we don't need believable science. Like, just, just give me an excuse. So it, right. j- just give me anything other than just because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll take your given, but, you know, uh, but it's got to it's gotta stay a given. Exactly, and it and and it's good to know why why that is. Hmm. Although you know, if, if he's telling me there's giant babies out in the concavity, then okay, yeah, then there are. <laughs> That's fine. You know, uh, we get last little little note here from Oren, which is uh, he's noticed that the wheelchair stalkers tend to disappear when Helen Steeply is around. Right. He'd right. noticed that after he left the Swiss Stortus's room. He'd seen a legless wheelchair person in the hotel lobby with the same Swiss accent. Mm. Yeah. And I believe we spend a little more time with him in the next chunk. Uh, moving on, we get a great part of the book, 20 pages and roughly three paragraphs with fucking lens. <laughs> Yay. I, I, I love this, I have to say. <laughs> this section, I love this, this entire section coming up. Yeah, we're we're gonna get a lot of DFW's like stream of consciousness thoughts. Where at least in this, it it, it has good reasoning. We're dealing with the, the perspective of a character who has gotten too high on cocaine right now. Mm-hmm. Of course. So yeah, so we're back on the walk with Green and an accidentally far too high on cocaine, Randy Lenz. Uh, Lenz complains of allergies, even though Green would know full well what a coke high looks like. Yeah. Lens shares that Charlotte Treat is trying to become a dental hygienist to teach children not to fear anesthesia, while a footnote reveals her father was a dentist that most likely molested his daughter using anesthesia at first. To, to quote Tom Waits, the large print giveth and the small print taketh away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. We, get, we get another mother story here. Lens tells how mm-hmm. his mother was morbidly obese and got stuck upside down in a Greyhound bus bathroom and sued and got a big settlement. This only increased her slovenliness and she eventually ruptured and died four months later after the settlement, stuffed to the gills with peach cobbler. Yes. Lenz received no inheritance from her, her settlement instead going to ex-husbands and pastry chefs, now surely tanning themselves on some far-flung beach. So right there, we not only get the typical... Uh, reference to the entertainment of somebody just stuffing themselves to the gills but mm-hmm. obviously we're dealing with the mother of an addict so that can be connected to his drug use as well yeah well there and and previous to that there's the uh, of course he he blames the uh greyhound bus incident for her death mm-hmm. um with that wonderful scene where she's in, she's in the bathroom of a Greyhound bus and the bus gets a little out of control and she uh, is stuck, winds up stuck with her ass out of the window of the Greyhound bus. Mm-hmm. Covered, covered in excrement and, and she's stuck yes. there for hours. And if I recall correctly, she's so big that the door is locked, but she's so big, there's really no give to the door. So she's like really, yeah. really stuck there. Yeah, and so she sues Greyhound uh, and gets a check uh, with, uh, that comes in an extra long, extra long envelope to accommodate all the zeros. Yep. And at that point, she lost all her will to do anything but eat. Pretty much, but yeah. it's a it's a it's a beautiful description of uh, her bouncing around in the oh in yeah the bathroom of the Greyhound bus. And honestly, as as somebody who's been on a Greyhound bus to Florida once, not really not too terrible an exaggeration of the conditions on a Greyhound. No, no, no. the the bath round on a Greyhound bus is surely a torture room in a level of hell somewhere. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so we get Bruce Green's background a little bit. We hear Bruce Green's father had been an aerobics instructor, even co-starring in a Buns <laughs> of Steel video, which I didn't realize till I read that. They just stopped making Buns of Steel. That thing, like, yeah. Buns of Steel ruled 6 a.m. infomercial television for, through the 90s, and then it just kind of vanished. I think Ty Bo took over. Uh, yes. the fitness infomercial uh, <laughs> world after Bonds of Steel. Yeah, I wonder how those infomercials work now that uh, so many people have moved to streaming as opposed to cable. It still has to be on there. I mean, it's, you know, it's money. Yeah. But... Anyway, so one day, Bruce Green's father, his legs were different sizes, although it was unclear whether one leg was shrinking or one was growing, or both. Mm -hmm. He had to change careers to working in novelties, as in like hand buzzers and uh, blamo cigars. He helps a toddler four-year-old little Brucey wrap up a gift, which he presents to Mrs. Green, a, ca a can of macadamia nuts, her favorite, quote, so good they should spell them S-I-N, only yeah. for her to open them and for spring-loaded snakes to pop out, causing her to have a heart attack. Yeah. Little... <laughs> <laughs> Little Brucey watched it all and never spoke another word out loud until fourth grade, while Mr. Green, from that day, left the Christmas tree rotting and the errant snake that got caught in the chandelier up and never removed them. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Green. I loved, oh, I loved yeah. the, I, I just loved the, the description of that scene. It, it was so... Uh, 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 Salvador Dali, Norman Rockwell. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, I, I didn't think of this at the time, but it reminds me a little, there's a few jokes in there where uh, Mr. Green mentions to Mrs. Green, like, okay, you're putting me on, come on. Okay, I'm sorry mm -hmm. I scared you. Uh, there was a famous British comedian. I don't remember his name. It was Tommy something. If you look up comedian dies on stage, you'll find it. This guy would do like a telethon every year. And this one year he's on stage and like a woman comes by and like a pretty woman walks by and he collapses and falls on his ass. And the whole crowd starts laughing and applauding. But then the guy just doesn't get up. Oh, and, no. and it's actually very infinite jest in like, you hear people laughing at him trying to move around, but like they're getting the sense like, oh, something's wrong. And then you literally see hands come from behind the curtain and pull him off camera. Oh, it no. Is, it is so disturbing. For what it's worth, he was an older gentleman. It was probably his time. But definitely like the most morbid, straight out of infinite jest. Like I, I, oh, I'm, wow. not, I'm dying up here, literally. Oh, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to watch that. Yeah, I, oh, I'm going to have to look that up. Uh, so, Mr. Green apparently had a little bit of a vendetta. He was later arrested for loading up a shipment of practical joke Blamo cigars with high-powered explosives, which decapitated over two dozen Shriners at a VFW. He was executed by lethal injection while little Brucey and his aunt stood outside the prison. Uh, since Green, since Green has checked with terror against hand buzzers and Shiner parades all his life. It's in the middle of these memories that Green realizes Lens is no longer with him and they've become separated. He's uncertain who blew off whom, but he doesn't consider it much. Now that he's fully exited the brain panic of withdrawal and detox, he only has roughly one fully developed thought every 60 seconds or so, a slow dripping faucet of a man. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's a... Uh... Another wonderful description of the is this the trial and conviction of his father. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're talking about you know how he packed a, a random case of outgoing Blamo cigars with uh, high explosive, mm -hmm. uh, high explosives. And a VF, what does it say? A VFW, three Rotarians, and 24 <laughs> Shriners had been grossly decapitated yeah. across southeastern Ohio. They busted him, of course, and uh, so now there's uh, the clock ticking down to the lethal injection of Green's father. 
Mm -hmm. And there's uh, a crowd um, of people, t-shirts for sale. Uh, these are red-faced men in sport coats and fezes. And, uh, and, oh, and I, they're I in their little, that. in their little, in their, in their little cars, uh, mm -hmm. doing their little formations out front of the, uh, out front, out front of the prison. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a beautiful scene. Yeah. If you, if anyone out there is unfamiliar, the Shriners are like a men's auxiliary. Uh, if you look up Shriners, tiny cars, or even look up the album cover to the Dead Kennedys album, Frankenchrist. They have the Shriners on the cover there. Very mm -hmm. interesting men. They do good work, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't deserve yeah. cigar, blammo, decapitation. No, 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 they didn't. And by They're the way, I... Selling, selling t-shirts mm -hmm. and shouting, burn, baby, burn. Or the more timely, get lethally injected. Get, baby, get lethally injected. <laughs> Oh, also, I, lo I looked it up. That uh, comedian who died on stage, his name is Tommy Cooper. So if you okay. look up Tommy Cooper dies live on stage and you're a little bit morbid, uh, you can find that on YouTube. Yeah, okay. That's me. That's oh, me. There we go. So speaking of morbid, Green catches up and spots Randy Lenz, but doesn't call out to him. They both seem to be following eerie Polynesian music playing out into the night air. Green sees Lenz approach a dog inside a fence and throw some Gately-style meatloaf to the dog. He sees Lenz sneak behind the dog, grab its scruff, and cut its throat, which prompts Green to leave the shadow and get closer. He hides when a horde of people in Hawaiian outfits spill out of the house to find a dead dog. They chase Lenz on foot but can't catch him. Some hop into a car and chase in his direction. They have clear Canadian accents. While Green watches all this, uh, he happens to notice two people in wheelchairs roll under the streetlights, looking in his general direction. Ooh. And we we lose green from there. We don't see what happens, but that is like very cinematic. I can I can picture that very clearly of yeah him him hiding behind a tree in the foreground and just the silhouette of two people in wheelchairs in the streetlight, which of yeah. course we know means bad news. Yes, yes. <laughs> And the the uh, just the description of the uh, dog aside was was uh, wonderful to see. Yes, but not not as good for the dog. But uh, no, well, well, no, <laughs> not so good. Not so good for the dog. Uh, interestingly, they they uh, the the people from the house jump into a into a, a hopped up uh, Mercury Montego, which is. That was my first car. So again, <laughs> so again, you know, written directly written for you, <laughs> just for me. Yes, exactly. Like, hey, I know that car. To the so, only, to the only other David I've ever loved, David Foster Wallace, right there on page one. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, um, okay, we now get the first first person narration by Na Mario in the entire novel. Uh, Mario turns 19 on Wednesday, November 25th. His insomnia has gotten worse in Madame Psychosis's now third week of absence. The network has even brought back the failed copy, Misdiagnosis, who's attempting to read the revelation of John entirely in pig Latin. Mario's disability is named familial dysautonomia, meaning he can't feel physical pain very well. He recently badly burnt his pelvis by obviously leaning obliviously, my, my bad, obliviously leaning against a hot stove for too long. He lays in his room hearing his mother upstairs. She frequently has night terrors, so he's used to all kinds of terrible sounds emanating from her room. He's been sleeping on an air mattress rather than in Hal's room due to his insomnia. Mario prays for an hour every night. He can't tell if Hal is sad. He's having a harder time reading Hal's moods lately, which bothers him as he used to have a great knack for knowing Hal's state of mind. Mario knows it is something with Hal because Mario never changes. Mario loves Hal so much it makes his heart beat hard. So I love Mario overall, but especially in this yeah. section, to go from this high pressure situation with uh, Green following Lens and the killing of the dog and the chase and all that, and then mm -hmm. to go into this, there's almost like a... It, 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 there's almost a relaxing feel just like even reading in Mario's perspective. It's like everything just gets cut off immediately and there's yeah. just a very 
chill thing going on in the background. I, I like this a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's very mood swinging. Well, um, I, I think part of and, it is, uh, and, almost every time we deal with first person perspective, we are dealing with somebody who's struggling a lot. And instead, mm -hmm. now we have Mario and he's just walking around feeling empathetic towards people. It's a completely yeah. different perspective than any we've dealt with in the book so far. Yeah, that's very true. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Um, yeah, Mario's a one, uh, uh, just, uh, I don't know. It's like his, his, his interior is the inverse of his exterior. Mm -hmm. And that he's, you know, a, a kind of a grotesque little, little character that uh, is, is just the, the inside is the inverse of the outside, which yeah. I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so we have here, Mario tends to go out for walks late at night, much to his mother's consternation. He has a general physical fearlessness, physical fearlessness, no doubt brought on by his aversion to pain though he would clearly be at the mercy of anyone who would do him harm. Avril does her best not to make Mario feel bad or wrong by expressing her worry and doesn't want Mario worrying about her worrying over him, which he absolutely does regardless. Um, yes. Mario likes walking down to Ennett House where he can empathize with people. The leader there, who is unnamed but we know is Pat Montesian, is also disabled and has a ramp and has invited Mario in before for soda. He likes it there because everyone is open. Nobody notices a disability and people talk about God without any sneer or self-consciousness. So, especially when we uh, um, started our chunk where, you know, we had uh, Jeffrey Day going around trying to be that dickheaded AA, like, oh yeah, well, could God make a burrito so hot he couldn't eat it? Like, really, really snide looks on that. So again, to have somebody not only expressing his God stuff, but enjoying seeing people like people can just speak aloud, out loud about it there without, uh, without judgment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially as we've dealt so much in this book with like the entire notion of a higher power and how hard that is for some people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you Mary, just see that naturally in Mario. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mario recognizes the sound of a recording of Madame Psychosis billowing from behind a curtain in Ennett. Little does he know Madame Psychosis herself is behind those walls or his family's personal connection to his beloved Madame. Mario had fallen in love with Madame Psychosis because he felt like he was listening to someone sad read out loud from yellow letters she'd taken out of a shoebox on a rainy night. He noticed that people at Enfield, once they hit a certain age, can't help but roll their eyes at anything real. This is, this is the most pointed part of uh, the irony versus sincerity argument that is a major theme of the book, where he, David Foster Wallace is directly putting his thoughts of sincerity into the mind of Mario. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, uh, that seems to be the function of Mario. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, uh, Mario had a terrible moment earlier in the year talking to Pemulus. Pemulus joked that he wanted to set up a dial a prayer line for atheists who, when they call, the line just rings and rings and never answers, which is a hilarious thing to do. Uh, Mario laughed, but he noticed he was the only one with a hearty fun laugh. The rest laughed like they'd laugh at someone with a disability. The whole issue went yeah. over Mario's head and Lyle was no help and Hal just called him boo-boo and acted as if Mario had wet himself. Uh, my final note here, Mario notes that all the people at Ennett coming in for curfew look scared, but are intentionally scowling to pretend they're not shy. Yeah, yeah. Do you get that a lot? You, you mentioned uh, your experience with AA, obviously, mm -hmm. respecting the second A of AA. You don't have to tell me anything you don't want to. But uh, uh -huh. do you feel like there is a certain amount of that, of like people with their walls up, just like, you know, uh, I, I've noticed a lot of people in life who were really scared and were doing their best to look like tough or mean or standoffish to, to, yeah. to cover their own vulnerability. Yeah, you see that with you see that with people who are first coming in for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Especially if they're under some type of uh, court order to do so, which they frequently. Oh yeah, do. yeah, and yeah, it's it's interesting. I've been to. 
uh, I, because I've lived in a number of places. Uh, you know, I've been to AA meetings in, in an urban, uh, upscale urban setting and uh, in a very rural country setting. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting that in, in every setting, there are, there are some similarities. There, there's always, uh, like the old timer's corner. Mm. Uh, like he, like he mentions earlier in the book, you know, the crocodiles. Love the uh, crocodiles. Yeah, yeah. There and there's a table of those guys in every meeting you go to. It seems mm -hmm. to me, anyway. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. I started reading this book, living, um, uh, coming out of uh, living on the west side of Chicago, being plunked down in. Um, uh, very abruptly in the hills of Northern California. And I read this book living in a tiny cabin in the woods. It's a hell of a change. Uh, yeah, yeah, it really, it really would uh, be uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a difference. <laughs> um, yeah, I was living off grid. I had kerosene lamps and uh, uh, a cat that used to bring me mice uh, every night. <laughs> And, uh, and, and a big copy of Infinite Jest and a sketchbook. Um, and uh, the, the meetings in, uh, in an area like that were interestingly just like the meetings uh, in Chicago. Uh, huh. And you get people coming in who um, aren't quite sure you know, and, and very quiet and not quite sure how to, how to come off mm -hmm. because there's a fair amount of sincerity that happens in these meetings and you watch these new people's faces and they're not quite sure what to do with, uh, you know, whatever persona they've decided to wrap themselves up with mm -hmm. um, when they come in. Um, so that, is, that, that seems to be an issue with like, uh, not not only in a scenario like that, but uh, to stick with the theme of the book, I feel like a lot of people have trouble being sincere in any kind of expression. Like I have a I have a family member in particular I'm thinking of who I won't mention for their own thing, but uh, he is somebody who could very very much use therapy, but he just is so opposed to it just to just to even go and express his thoughts feels like such a vulnerable violation for him. Meanwhile, I'm, you know, I'm more the extroverted one in the family. Like, you know, yeah, I'll go on stage and talk about, you know, talk about embarrassing sex stories. Why not? So, <laughs> yeah. So, so I never quite understood, just because I'm not wired that way. But, but for somebody like that who, and it is a more, if anything, I would say the bigger extrovert telling people everything is more rare than the person you know, who really is uncomfortable expressing themselves. And then you put them in a public scenario like AA mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, not only to express themselves, but to watch other people expressing it, which in and of itself might be uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I, yeah, I found, I found uh, AA tough myself um, because it was, uh, you know, Anybody, anybody trying not to drink uh, may have trouble listening to stories about people getting hammered mm. uh, every, every time, every time you go in. For me, uh, it made me just want to go find a bar. <laughs> wow. Why do you, why do you think that was? Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, you know, there, there's something, uh, in AA that uh, a common denominator I've found for people who, who do well in AA, and it's those people who have hit bottom at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those are, the, those are the people who are more successful in the program. There are a lot of people who come in who haven't really reached that yet. They're mm -hmm. close but they haven't quite reached it yet. Right. Um, and those are the people that, that come and come and go. Um, uh, 
And I think that, that it is reaching that bottom that uh, can ensure that the AA is going to, is going to work for you. If that makes any kind of sense. No, no, I get that. You definitely need a, I, I've heard that before that you'd need to, in order to do the full submission to the program and to change your way of life, you need to have taken like enough damage to go like, I just, I cannot live this way anymore and I'll do anything to change it. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to hit that spot where you know that, uh, you know, going out and, and having, having some drinks is, it isn't going out. Exactly. Um, yeah. And you know, you can go through you can go through a lot and and fall back on drinking or drugs or whatever mm -hmm. um, uh, but at at some point it's got to dawn on you that it it and you have to really believe that you know this isn't going to work and maybe this is just making everything harder right and and there's also a, a certain part of it uh I've dealt with this less with alcohol, but more, you and I discuss mental illness. Um, I have a, an anxiety disorder, which runs in the family, which I didn't find out until I, you know, spent about three weeks convinced I was dying every day when my mother said like, oh yeah, no, it's panic. Everybody in the family has it. But, yeah, oh, thanks. <laughs> but uh, one of the real struggles of that is really having to realize that uh, you cannot trust your body's own senses that like you're, your wiring at some point has gotten crossed. And yeah. I think that's equally with anxiety. I mean, the whole problem with anxiety is you've attributed, you've attributed danger to something that is not dangerous. And as you try to avoid that not dangerous danger, it's going to get bigger to the point where like, if you're in the grocery store when you have a panic attack and now you just are terrified every time you go to the grocery store because you have mm -hmm. subscribed meaning to that. But same thing with addiction, where you need to come to terms where it's like alcohol has rewired you at this point. And yeah, it makes you feel good, but it's lying to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, and it's lying to you in the same way that mental illness lies with you, lies to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it is, uh, you know, you, you have to somehow get a grip on what's real and what's not real mm -hmm. um you know a, a, a panic attack is is by virtue of your brain telling you something and you believe it yeah um i know uh you know for for me i battled uh mental illness without knowing what it was mm -hmm. for close to 40 years oh wow um and uh, left a lot of wreckage behind me and, and, and convinced myself that I was still a good guy though. Mm. Um, and that, you know, all of the crazy things I thought and believed, um, of course they were real because I thought them and mm. I believed them. Um, you know, I'm, I am the center of my universe after all. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so I think, um, I don't even know where I'm going with this. Well, no, it's, I, I would say that definitely ties into the book because I know at some point he talks about that where just the impossibility, oh wait, no, uh, it was in This Is Water where he discusses that. Like our, our brains are wired to make us the center of attention just because I believe in philosophy, it's called the problem of other minds. Like you cannot yeah. actually know what anybody else is feeling. You don't, you don't know if somebody else sees the color red the same way you do. Maybe their red looks no. green. You would never know. And yet, yeah. to get uh, a better view on the world, you need to somehow find a way to like break your mind's camera out of its box and try to look at it from other perspectives that your senses, might, that, that your senses are incapable of grabbing for themselves. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, I, I remember for a, a number of years trying to get into, while trying to figure out what the hell my problem was, get into things like Zen meditation mm -hmm. uh, in, order to, in order to find a way to get out of, get out of myself. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I, I had, I, I personally had gotten to the point where I, I, so many weird things had happened that I realized that the common denominator in, in all of these, uh, uh, all of these scenarios was me. Mm-hmm. So like, Ooh, maybe, maybe it's not them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, I am, I'm actively dealing with this right now with somebody literally texting me as we speak, who uh, I made films with back in the day. And lately he's been trying to get in touch with everybody from the old days, but like he's burned bridges with everybody. Nobody's answering their phones. And he, he thinks it's all us. Like, ah, these people want to stop me. It's like, no dude, like you're, you, I haven't talked to you in years. You owe me $1,500 and then you show up on my doorstep saying, why won't you let me finish this movie? Like, what? Yeah. What? Why? Uh, yeah. 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 Well, I know. Yeah. And I know for, for a lot of my young life, I was that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can't, you can't see, you can't see past uh, your own eyelids. A lot of um, times I, you know, un- unless, got, unless you have Blafaro spectacity, which was last week's uh, word of the week, right? Which means right. being able to see their, your own eyelids. <laughs> right, right. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> I'm happy to have brought that back up. <clears throat> there we go. Um, yeah. So what I, I like the varying points of view in this book. It mm-hmm. seems, it seems to, uh, you know, take us into into characters' reality and then back out. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah, and I uh, talk about that. I think is interesting. Yeah, no, I really love the concept of uh, the soft third person perspective that we've seen lately. Where mm-hmm. even though we're dealing with a narrator telling us the you know lens, it's not lens felt. I, I mean, it's not I felt like killing a dog. It's lens felt like killing a dog. However, right. the, the descriptors of the world around there are very much colored by that character as opposed to a neutral narrator would typically. Right, happen. right. Uh, well, I feel like we could go on forever, but I think we uh, knocked this one out. We, we got into some good stuff here, David. Good, good. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much for being on the podcast. Um, if you could remind us again where to find you. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at uh, and Twitter at Infinite Jensen. Um, and some of the people out there, Jensen, that is J-E-N-S-E-N. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and on Tumblr at Infinite Jensen as well, uh, where all of that just contains my drawings from In- Infinite Jest. Okay. And again, if you're listening to this, I'm going to try to... Uh, for the YouTube version of this video, I'm going to try together to put together a little slideshow with some of David's work so you can check it out. Uh, I, I can't recommend it enough. It, if you love this book, you will love these sketches, definitely, of some oh, of your favorite you. scenes. So, yeah, David, thank you for being with us today. I'm going to end like I end every episode. I will now stop recording, but you and I can keep talking. <laughs> Fantastic. All right.